Okay, let's pray. Let's pray together, please, and we will start. Father, we thank you once again for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to get together and learn. And we pray that you'll give us wisdom, understanding, uh, write your truth on our hearts, in our minds. That we may be able to speak it, share it with others, and strengthen others and lead people to encounter Jesus Christ. We thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last, was it last week? Last week we had class? Oh, last week, uh, oh, we had class on Thursday, right? Okay, okay, one, one day we had class. Okay, so we, we finished on the uniqueness of Jesus, right? Uh, any questions on that? Lesson number 10, on the uniqueness of Jesus. Okay, let's go ahead and start with lesson number 11. Um, so what we want to do now is address another topic, which is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, this happened 2,000 years ago. You and I are here today. 2,000 years later. And we are saying we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Bodily, he rose from the grave. We didn't see it. We were not there. How can we be, how can we be convinced and how can we help others to know this? And especially, you know, uh, let's say, uh, this is also very important when we are speaking to Muslims, people from Muslim faith. So how, because they have a lot of theories. Jesus didn't actually die. He just swooned on the cross. And so they put him, they, he became all right, and then they said he's living. But imagine how, how many months he must have taken to become all right. <laughs> At least one year from all those <laughs> beating, right? Anyway, so they have lots of theories, also things, right? How can we, based on the information we have, based on the gospel accounts, how can we, uh, you know, communicate logically the resurrection of Jesus? Now, one is, of course, there is a supernatural side to it. That means we are convinced in our hearts because we have tasted and seen, we have experienced Jesus in our lives, right? So we have tasted and seen. Uh, and so we have encountered Jesus uh, in a very real way. Nobody can take that away from us. But logically speaking, based on information given in the Gospels, how can we um, present this to somebody? Now, uh, just as a, some background, uh, there was a man named Josh McDowell. Uh, uh, this was back, I think, in the 70s, 70s, 80s. Uh, and he was a skeptic. He didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't believe that. And so he wanted to investigate. As a journalist, as a researcher, he wanted to investigate. Is this true or not? So he went, he did, took this up like, uh, like you know, I call it research. So he studied the, what, was the, what the accounts of the gospel studied all the archaeological evidence, go see the place, everything, is it like what the Bible is saying, or is this some made-up story? So he put all these things, and then in the end, he himself became a believer. And he wrote one big book. In those days, it was very, you know, very, uh, what to say, a very famous. It was called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And he put all his findings, evidence, why the resurrection of Jesus is not a hoax, but it is a fact. You know, he put it, he wrote a book. And then from there, of course, uh, his, his, uh, his own ministry began, uh, uh, and uh, Josh McDowell uh, 
uh, was very well known. You know, uh, now of course he's very old, elderly old, but he was very well known in those days as an apologetics. You know, and and based on the evidence like this, talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And so on. now his ministry is continuing. His his son, uh, I think his son's name is Sean McDowell or something. He's continuing the ministry and all of that. But in those days, that was a very important book. Evidence that demands a verdict. Where he spent a lot of time researching, looking at all these things, and then he came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot be questioned by just looking at the evidence or information that is given and other archaeological evidence and so on. So, uh, so we know what actually happened. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, was crucified on the cross between two thieves. The by sundown, usually by six o'clock in the evening, or when it's coming close to that, if the peep, the person has not already died on the cross through crucifixion, the pain of that, then the soldiers will come and they will break their uh, knees, they break them there, so that the weight of the body will suffocate and they will die. But in the case of Jesus, when the Roman soldier came to do that, that was a normal procedure. So he did it for the other thieves. But when he came to do that for Jesus, he found that Jesus was already dead. So instead of breaking the legs, he pierced the side. Pierced the side. To verify that Jesus was already So who did the Roman soldier verify it? It wasn't some other person. Like it wasn't some close friend of Jesus saying, hey, we'll just pretend he's dead. No, 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 no. The Roman soldiers were in, in responsible for the crucifixion. They did their job properly. And so he verified Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, one of the disciples of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, he went. And he got permission to take the body and he offered his own tomb, his own tomb. So I will put my, I had prepared this tomb, I will put my body there. So he got permission from the priests. But the high priests insisted that a Roman guard must stand in front of the tomb. Because they said, hey, this Jesus had said before he died he said three days after that he will rise up so lest anything happen okay you take the body and put it in the tomb but there will be a roman seal and a roman guard standing there roman seal means they put a, like a ribbon or a, a, a cloth rope across the stone where that is sealed I mean, nobody can touch this now don't break this. And 12 guards are standing in front. Not one guard. Uh, 12 guards are standing in front of that tomb. Then, the other thing is, they, uh, they have, so as the custom was in those days, when they are preparing the body for burial, they wrap the whole body in cloth and they put some uh, uh, you know spices and all that, which will make it like a hard case. Like, a, like for us, we have a plaster of Paris, now you put it and then it becomes hard. So they have they, they put all the spices, the thing embalm the body and uh, put it on that so that it becomes strong slowly it will become strong so they did that to the body of Jesus so you remember Lazarus when Lazarus after four days Jesus said lose him and let him go that means you have to pull this cloth off his body he came walking that also is a, this is a miracle 
he, he rose up, he came walking out of the, the tomb. And uh, then Jesus said, lose him and let him take all the bandage cloth off. So they did that for the body of Jesus. Put in the tomb. So his body was fully covered. And there's a one cloth that covers the face. And then they put the full you know, cloth around. And they put all the spices, everything. Put the body in the tomb. And the stone is not one small stone. It's a big, heavy stone that is usually moved. Three, four strong people have to move the stone and close the tomb. <laughs> okay, so you think about all these details. And there are Roman guards in front, Roman seal. Sunday morning, uh, to Ma Ma Mary Magdalene and Mary, they saying, let us go. Uh, maybe they thought we can request the guards, can you please open the stone tomb? We want to put some more spices and things like that on the body. So they made preparation. And they are going there. Fully expecting, we will make a request. Guards are very strong. Can you please open the tomb? We just want to embalm the body, put something, and come. Out of respect. So they are prepared, they are going. When they come, guards are not there. Stone is also not there. And stone is moved up. Guards are missing. And they go inside. And very strange. They find the face cloth, one place. Rest of it is all folded and kept. So it's folded and kept. They get scared. And then when they come out, uh, that's when Jesus appears. And, you know, so. so they have to look at this whole scenario. And from then on, Jesus appears to, for 40 days, he showed himself, shows himself alive to many different people. So from all of this, from the Bible accounts, how can we prove the resurrection of Jesus? Right? So go through these things one by one. Fact number one. The broken Roman seal. In those days, if the Romans had put a seal somewhere, no crossing, something, some... Anybody violated that, those days, only one thing, we'll kill you. Finish, that's it. You're not supposed to do it. Not fine, it to be fine. Finished. That is, a, that, is, that is the penalty for breaking the Roman seal. So here, so nobody would dare to do it. But the Roman seal was gone, broken. Who could have done it? The disciples won't do it. Because they know the consequences. It is. It means you are going to be crucified. You will. Be, you will be killed. So the Roman seal was broken. Who broke it? The soldiers could do it if they are given orders. So yeah, if you have permission, okay. But just like that, you can't. Right? Would the disciples have done it? Soldiers would not allow them to do it. They'll stop them. Hey, you have any permission? To do this. Secondly, there's the empty tomb. Now, think about this. Suppose we wanted to create a story, you know, just come up with a story that Jesus rose from the dead. Ideally, what you'll now do, you'll take the body, you'll go very far away. From Bangalore, you'll go to Uttarakhand. Put it in a cave there. And then you say, he rose up from the dead. The people in Bangalore won't know. They can't verify. 
because uh, you, he was buried somewhere far, far away. You can't go and check. But this, they didn't do that. The body was buried right there in the city. In the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. No, he can't make any mistake. This is his tomb. This is his land. This is his tomb. Can't make a mistake. No, not even go to the wrong grave. Another thing. Here. In the city. Go see. It is open. It's empty. So if they wanted to create, do some, what to say, some trick, play a trick, they would have thought something different. No, let's take the body, let's overnight, we will go somewhere far away, we'll put him in a cave there, and then we will just hide his body somewhere and we'll say he rose up from the dead. We'll make some story like, no, no, this was all right, right in Jerusalem. So there is no makeup, there is no, you know, some trick behind this. No, but tomb is there, we put him there, right there. You can go see it. The tomb is empty. There were guards in front of the tomb. There was a Roman seal in front of that tomb, right there. Seal is broken, guards have disappeared, stone is removed. Go see for yourself. So, just thinking about that logically, if somebody wanted to play the fool, you know, trick people, they would have done something different. But this empty tomb was right in the city of Jerusalem. Number three, there was a large stone that was moved. And the question is, who moved the stone? Because soldiers would not have done it. They are supposed to guard it. And two women are coming with spices. You think those two women would have moved the stone when the guards are sitting there? Or not even the strong disciples would be allowed to do it. But the stone has been moved. And interestingly, it's been moved up the slope. If you want to move it, push it out in a hurry, push it down the slope. It's moved up. Stone has been moved. Who moved the stone? The three potential parties, soldiers, two women, two disciples, none of them would have moved it. But the stone is moved. So, who did that? Okay. Number four, the Roman guards ran away. Why did they run away? Because they didn't even, like something happened, they couldn't stop it. And now their life was at risk because they failed in their duty. So at least if there were, you know, another group of men who came, imagine if the 11 disciples of Jesus came with swords and things and said, hey, we want to open this, we want to take his body. There would have been a battle fight between the Roman soldiers and the eleven disciples. Surely the soldiers would have finished them off. And soldiers will feel very proud. We protected the tomb. We killed all the remaining eleven. Something. But here nothing. They, they had it's nothing. They were rendered powerless. God had supernaturally overpowered them. Stone was moved, body is gone, and they're there, they're holding their swords, everything, but everything is gone. What will they say? So they went to the high priest. High priest said, You don't worry, you go hide, just spread the news. Disciples came and stole the body or something. You just go, we will take care of the matter. It's meaning they would have paid the Roman government saying, Keep quiet, this is what happened. Some story they're given. So they just go disappear. So 
the Roman soldiers have disappeared. That itself is another, you know, evidence here that the body supernaturally was taken out of the grave. Number five, grave clothes were left behind. So imagine if the disciples, even just imagine, somehow the disciples, somehow the disciples came to take the body. What would they have done? They would have taken everything and gone fast. They won't say, come, let us take the face cloth, put it here. Let us take the grave cloth, fold it, keep it here nicely. Quickly, they would have just taken the body, everything run. They're not going to take time to do all this. But what do we find inside the tomb? He says, everything was there. Grave cloth was left behind. The, the, the cloths wrapping the body is left there. So how? How is that possible? It's not normal. Because if we came to steal the body, you'll take everything and go. How come it's left here? That is the only thing. You know. Hey, how is this possible? Number six, Jesus' appearances have been confirmed. Like lots of people said, we saw him alive. There were 500 witnesses, not one, two, ten, twenty. 500 eyewitnesses. Jesus, in that 40 days, Jesus appeared to 500 people. That's a lot of people who saw him alive. And what's important is this. There were hostile witnesses. That means people who were against Jesus saw him alive. First, Saul of Tarsus. This was almost uh, 20 or 20 plus years after he rose. Saul, the conversion of Saul to Paul. That's a very powerful testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. Because this man was a persecutor. And his whole reason for believing in Jesus is, as he was going to Damascus, he encountered Jesus. Now that had to be true, otherwise he would not follow Jesus. He encountered the real Jesus. But another important thing is also the family members of Jesus. Because in John chapter 7, we see that Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. Now John 7 verse 3. Uh, oh, sorry. yeah, uh, John 7 verse 5. Say, For even his brothers did not believe in him. John 7 verse 5. During his ministry, for three years, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe. They say he must be doing some trick. He must be fooling the people. He must be doing something. We know we don't believe. We know we were playing marbles with him. We were playing cricket, whatever. Or we played all games. But now he's he's doing all these things. They didn't believe. But after the resurrection, what do we read? Acts one fourteen. These all continued one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now brothers are sitting there in the upper room. Before his death and resurrection, they did not believe. Just 40 days later, or 40 plus 10, 50 days on the day of Pentecost, or coming to the day of Pentecost, 40 days later, these brothers are sitting with the rest of the disciples in the upper room. Only thing has happened is Jesus rose from the dead. He was crucified, buried, he rose from the dead, now they believe. That's the only thing that made 
his own brothers believe. Before this, earthly ministry, no, you know, he must be doing some trick. Something is going on. But now they believe. So, that itself is a big testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. And last two, page 75, the disciples' own lives. The disciples, if they had made up some story, if they all had conspired and said, hey, we will hide his body somewhere, put it under the ground somewhere, hide it, tell everybody he rose from the dead. Okay, you played a game like that. But if it comes to your own life, will you stand up for that? Say, no, no, I'll tell, don't kill me, I'll tell you where I put him. <laughs> when it comes to their own life, if they lied, made up one story, at least one of them would have spoken up. But all of them, except for John, all muttered. They went far places preaching Jesus, willing to die for this truth. We saw him rise from the dead. We can't say anything else. No. Only John died of old age. That he was sent away to the island of Patmos, but everyone else was martyred. So, so, disciples, if it was a lie, if they were all playing some game, at least one of them would have said, hey, I'll tell the truth. <laughs> I will open up. All of them died believing, preaching, believing, proclaiming his resurrection. And then, we can attest to the fact that Miracles were happening in that name. How can miracles happen in the name of a dead man? Miracles happen. They perform. We are, until now, we continue to pray and minister in that name. So, um, when you look at all of these things, very logically, say, hey, you think about this. We can only tell you what actually happened. These are the sequence of events that happened. This is what actually happened. It is all very logical, and it is all pointing to the fact that Jesus really rose up from the dead. It's not a made-up story. Because if somebody wanted to make up a story, these things would not have taken place. Yeah? Question? Yeah. About the miracles, like in Jesus' name, so, and even in the like black magic people will do, they will say miracles happen there also. How can we clarify these both things? Hmm. Good. So, if people are do, uh, yeah, there people, so miracles do happen with black magic and so on. So, we know that uh, Satan does lying signs and wonders. We know that. So people who are doing uh, fortune telling, palm reading, they, to some extent, no, they are correct. They know facts. They can tell facts based on the empowering coming from evil spirits. They can do it. But their power is limited. And the power of God is greater than that. So if somebody says, you know, hey, you know, this person is doing miracles, so, 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 so we understand that, yeah, there are other, there are dark powers, demons, evil spirits who also do these things. And, uh, but that does not take away from what is true, from the power of God. Right? So there are these, these signs in one. So we understand how it happens. And we can explain. If they're willing to listen, we can explain. But always we say the power of God is greater. And we have authority over those things. So that is where the test comes. Then we can cast out evil spirits in the name of Jesus. 
We can do that. And we can show that the name of Jesus is more powerful than evil spirits. Okay, any questions? Let me just check the online. Yes, go ahead. One comment and one question. Uh, the Old Testament has a prophecy that you know not one of his bones will be broken. So could that be the uh, possible? Just say that again. Old Testament has a prophecy that no, not one of his bone will be broken. Will be broken. Yeah. So that is one of the reason that before the Roman uh, uh, soldier tried to, you know, verify yes. with the bones. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I think it is Psalm 34 was 20. I think it is. So. Yeah, so a lot of the Old Testament prophecies are all being fulfilled right there on during uh, during his crucifixion. Right? So one of them is that not one of his bones will be broken. Psalm, let me see. Yeah, correct. Psalm 34, 20. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. So uh, you know, they for my clothes they cast lots. Uh, they divided my garments. They said divided my garments among them. They cast lots. So all these prophecies, everything happening there during Christmas, tuck, 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 the prophecy being fulfilled, including this that his bones will not be broken. And uh, another thing, Pastor, if you look at the Bible, uh, can one uh, easily conclude that resurrection of Jesus is one of the great, greatest miracle and there's nothing that can supersede this? Yes. If you were to put it that thing? Yeah. Because if the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, there would be no salvation. All that he endured on the cross and all that happened from the cross to the grave if it did not end up in his resurrection and exaltation, then salvation could not be given to us. The devil would have succeeded in stopping it there, in stopping God's plan. So the resurrection is crucial. It's very important. Right? And uh, so we need to be convinced that what the gospel is telling us about the resurrection of Jesus is true. It is simple, but it's very clear. There's no need to question. It's there. The details are given to us. And very clear that Jesus Christ rose up from the grave. Right? Yes. Sorry, what? Oh, the clothes. So, um, we don't know for sure. There is something called the Shroud of Turin, which people think could be the cloth that was that was covered his face and they've tried to reconstruct the face of Jesus from that and all that but we don't know for sure whether that is actually the original cloth or you know. so so to answer your question we don't know uh, yeah there's no way to like say okay exactly this is it but they they have some or to say uh, what they think could could have been, yeah. yeah. All right. Any questions from our online students? All right. So let's just. Uh, Quickly do lesson 12. It's a very, uh, just a quick uh, short, short note. Uh, we'll finish that and we'll continue the others tomorrow. So when we proclaim Jesus, we have to proclaim it in a very clear way, saying that, as number 12, salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. Very clear. Right? We don't say, well, you can have salvation in Jesus and maybe you can have salvation in so and so and so and so and so. No, no, no. We don't say that. Salvation is only in Jesus. That 
they have to be very clear and what we proclaim also has to be very clear so that's where you know in the world today uh, there is pluralism and relativism Plural, pluralism means many gods many ways to salvation plural many so the moment we say there is only one way people don't like it why are you saying only one way you're so you know you're so uh, narrow-minded you're not tolerant of other faiths and all. no 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 bible says there's only one way and it's not relative. The Bible, Bible is absolute truth. There is absolute truth. Bible is absolute truth. And the reason we say Jesus is the only way for salvation, that's the word of God, clearly states that. We have shared this before. Secondly, because of the uniqueness of Jesus, we have given nine reasons already why Jesus Christ is so unique. Nobody can compare with that. We've gone through those nine reasons. And thirdly, we are saying it's Jesus alone who's addressing the issue of sin and he's bringing us into a relationship with God. There is no other philosophy or religion that is giving a solution. Say, so here's the answer for sin. And here is how you can have relationship with God in, in such a clear way. They may say, you try to do this, you do these step five things, you do these six things, and you may be able to overcome sin, or you may be able to attain salvation. It's all maybe, depending on your efforts. Only the gospel of Jesus is saying, Jesus has finished the work, it is done, and is given to you as a free gift. Salvation is given to you as a free gift. Somebody else did the work. You only have to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. So that message is very, very different. Right? So these are three reasons why we say Jesus is the only way. There's salvation only by faith. Uh, only through Jesus Christ. And what's so amazing is that it's received by grace through faith. It's very, very different from how other uh, people, uh, other religions or may offer. All we have to do is repent and believe. Right? So, um, if somebody says, I'm at the very end on page 78, if somebody says, oh, all roads lead to you, you people believe like this, we believe like this, they believe like that, we will all end up there only. Then we say, look, if you're going in opposite direction, you're going in opposite direction, how can you say we'll end up in the same place? You're going opposite, that's where you're going. Okay. And how can things that contradict each other be true? One has to be true. If there are two opposites, both can't be true. So if the Bible is saying there's salvation only in Jesus, either it's true or it's not true. You can't say, well, this is true and salvation everybody else. Well, no, Bible is saying there's salvation only in Jesus. Either it's true or not true. Right? I mean, Jesus said, you cannot come to the Father except through Him. Either that is true or not true. It can't be that He is true and everybody else is true. Because He said He's the only way. Right? So, uh, we'll have, you know, we, we see that logically you can't just say Jesus one way and everybody other ways are also there. So, we'll stop here for today. What we want to do tomorrow is how do we share Christ with a Hindu? How do we share Christ with a so we have looked at okay, Jesus is uniqueness, the resurrection is real, the Bible is presenting that there is salvation only in Jesus. Now, how can we bring that to a person who's a Hindu? 
how do we bring that to a person who is a Muslim? So the approach we will take is we will try to understand little bit about Hinduism, a little bit about Islam. We're not, we, we don't need to understand everything or read the whole Quran and everything. No, just, just understand what they believe. So that when we are talking to them about Jesus, we make it very clear to them. So there's no confusion in their minds. What we are saying and what is, you know, how Jesus is very different. Right? So we have to, so we will address that tomorrow uh, in our class. Okay. Any questions before we close? All right. Okay, so let's pause here for today. Any questions? We'll pause here for today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll continue on how to share Christ with a Hindu and Muslim.